Last week we mentioned the uncanny valley. The uncanny valley is a psychological reaction to seeing something that seems not quite 100% real, but very, very close to it. For example, most a human being looks 100% real. Uh, we're able to tell that. But if you look at the Polar Express and the animated children in there, they look almost 100% real, but you can tell they're not. You can tell there's a little something wrong, a little something off in the characters. That's the Uncanny Valley. When you come back to the other side of it, for example, anime characters with big eyes, or cartoon characters with exaggerated features, then once again we're back on the other side of the valley and we know, hey, these aren't real, obviously. That's why we tend to think the cartoon characters and anime characters is cute, but some of the new robots as creepy. So, in the spirit of Halloween, I got to thinking, and this is hardly an original quote, I've seen this other people raise this as well. If the Uncanny Valley is a learned response deep in our psyche that we have evolved into having. What creature did we encounter sometime in our prehistory that was so dangerous that we needed to be really worried about them and looked almost but not quite human? What did we come across that we need the Uncanny Valley to survive? Happy Halloween and on with the show. We have over 100 years of wonderful recorded music out there. So why do most people listen to the same 100 songs? Like the treasures on the shelves of a thrift shop. There are so many great songs out there waiting for us to find. Let's find those treasures together. I am David Rankin, and this is The Old Mill Shop. Next segment is fresh off the truck. Greetings fellow shoppers. It's Friday, October 28th, and this is the Old Mill Shop. In this segment, we're going to be covering the uh, new songs that have been released in the previous month. Okay. There are being released in the upcoming month, and uh, songs that are new and deserve your attention or are being re-released and deserve a second, uh, third, or fourth look. The first song that we wanted to call out was by ZZ Ward and Alec Black. ZZ Ward is an excellent young blues singer who's up and coming. She's got several albums under her belt now, several songs with television series, a couple of good collaborations, including a wonderful song with Lindsey Sterling, Hold My Heart, that I am Dor. Alex Black is the fella who sang with Avicii on Wake Me Up. Just an incredible uh, singer of his own right who is working through a very good career of his own. The two of them together have come out with a song called Tin Cup. It's incredibly deep and bluesy and I adore the harmony between the two of them. Go out, uh, the link will be in the description, go out, take a look, watch the song, put it in your playlist and enjoy it. The second song that I want to call out is uh, L. King's Try Jesus. I have not been a great fan of L. King. She is technically a good singer, but her song choices and her on-screen personality have wandered towards the, uh, the biggest witch in the West, if you want to use that euphemism. I'm divided on the personality she portrays. Uh, she's releasing a country album. This time she's releasing a song called Try Jesus. It's a popish country song and I expected more of a Megan Morris style church song where yeah you're going to talk about church but it's actually the music but I was surprised. She actually is talking about Jesus in a conventional sense and saying that she's had no luck with other options. She needs to try Jesus. I respect her that if she's put if she's putting it out because she means it, I think that's incredibly courageous of her. I like the message, I like the song, and I would suggest it to anyone who wanted to listen to it. Go out, we'll have a link in the description. Play Try Jesus and give that song a try. Today's two for one special, believe by share. 
Before we begin the two for one special, let's talk about uh, last week's music. For Monday, the vintage corner was 3220 Blues by Richard Johnson. Tuesday, Don't Throw Out My Legos by AJR. Wednesday, Send Me On My Way by Rusted Root. Thursday, Made Up Mind by Bonnie Raitt. And Friday, Jubilation Day, Steve Martin and the Steep Canyon Rangers. Next week, we're going to end the uh, vacation videos and go back to the, to a standard format of me uh, simply presenting the songs. We are going to skip the uh, Vintage Corner on Monday in return for a special Halloween song. So we're going to talk a bit about the Vintage uh, Corner in our next segment instead. But the rest of the week will be standard random choices. So let's talk about today's two-for-one special, On the Water by Steve Martin and Steve Canyon Rangers. Uh, Jubilation Day was a fun little tune uh, that fit well in the bluegrass path, but uh, On the Water is an entirely different feel, even if it is from the same group. Uh, Steve puts his comic chops away for the song and plays a very serious, very uh, understated banjo. The whole song is very underproduced, a very simple, very understated, but incredibly, incredibly beautiful. I love going down to Gulf Shores. I'm not a sailor particularly, but I love going to the beach. I love taking friends and family and getting out. As Jimmy calls it, I love uh, when the circus has left town. So I love to go and relax at the beach. And this song makes me feel like I feel when I'm relaxing in Gulf Shores. I love this line. Time away with friends is time reclaimed. That's an incredible message and it's a and it's a lovely song. Take a listen, find a copy of this uh, song, and get it in your collection as well. On the Water, Steve Martin and the Steep uh, Canyon Rangers. <laughs> Since we will miss the Vintage Corner this Monday, let's talk about a bit of a Vintage Corner song as part of the early recording industry, Louis Armstrong's classic King of the Zulus. Sound recording has always been trying to take the sound out of the air, putting it into some physical markings or mechanical markings or ink markings or whatever, so that that recording could then be replayed back into sound sometime in the future. There were a few recording methods pre-Edison. Most of them used ink or mechanical paper markings, but none of them were actually designed at the time to be able to be played. We have a couple of old recordings that have been run through a computer and we can tell that there's something there more than static. But the first practical sound recording and playback technology was Edison's wax cylinders, but they also still had the problem that they were extremely hard to make because of their uh, cylindrical form and the fact that the material was soft. You had to basically play the sound once each time you cut the grooves in the wax. It wasn't until the 78 RPM flat disc was developed that we finally developed a process that had the ability to be mass produced. To record a wax or vinyl flat disc, the factory will take a master recording at 78 RPM and make a generation zero copy of the song. That will then be used to create a reverse metal copy of the disc. That reverse copy can stamp the ridges into the final record. So that you will take two masters and then squish the, the flat disc between them and press those ridges into the disc on both sides. Uh, the, the advantage of this is it only takes a few seconds at most to uh, press the disc with the two masters and because the masters are so much harder than the vinyl you can make a lot of records out of a single master until they wear out and you have to recreate them. 
Essentially, this is the same process the vinyl records use even unto this day, even though most albums now are 33 RPM and therefore denser, the technology hasn't significantly changed. The master discs, however, has changed. The very first generation of masters were simply recorded in the studio straight through. The, because it was a purely mechanical process, there would be one large sound horns that were designed to concentrate the sound from multiple instruments and people down into the needle that would cut the groove in the master disc. This only allowed a room so big and required uh, significant placement. So let's listen to this speaking segment of King of the Zulus. Wait, man, wait, stop, stop, wait. Oh, what do you mean? Hey, what do you mean by interrupt my solo? Man, a classic from Jamaica, and I don't mean to interrupt the party, but one of my countrymen tell me there's a chitlin rob going on here. Madam, fix me one out of those things you call chitlin, but I call them in a tube, and I play one of my native jazz tunes. So our speaker, uh, Charles Babcock, interrupts Louis's horn solo. From their respective volumes, you can tell that Charles, as a speaker who's not playing anything, is quite close to the sound horn. Louis, with his horn, has had to step back uh, significantly from the sound horn, or he will simply blow the record off the edges. And Lil his wife, is probably at the far side of the room behind the piano yelling over the piano to try to be heard, just like she would be if she were trying to be heard from a far kitchen. And the sound effects work out for the story, but you can tell just based on the sounds how far each person is in the room. Large instruments like the piano and loud instruments like horns and trumpets, trombones would have to be farther away and a lot of times have muffles or played softly. Uh, we have almost no examples of drummers because there was no way you could use the drums in any uh, setup because the drums will put way too much sound into the recording studio. Occasionally, we have a very few examples of drummers tapping on boxes, very similar to how some bands use the cajones as in essentially tapping on boxes and, and use microphones to enhance the sound. That's something that occurred in the 20s as well, but very, very rarely. We have very few recordings of good drummers in the 20s eras. It wasn't until the um, invention of the electronic microphone and invention of the rec electronic recording elements that allowed this uh, kind of deadlock to be broken. Uh, once you had electronic microphone, you could combine electrical signals and then regulate their output so they didn't overwhelm a record. You can also use a soundboard to get relative levels. So one person sings at one, one, one sings at a, their natural level. You can spread them out. Uh, the piano can get a microphone. Even the drums can get a microphone with a serious turn down and putting that sound into the record at a non-dangerous level. Each person could be mixed in a soundboard to where you, each person could have their own microphone and each microphone could have its own output level. And that was the invention of the soundboard. The soundboard eventually allowed the invention of electronic recording and then mixing. But that's another story for another time. So right now, uh, we want to say thank you and keep shopping. This is David Rankin for the Gold Mill Shop. Good day. Please come back for the next episode of The Old Mill Shop. Thanks to Apple for use of the Samantha voice. Thanks to Zapsplat at www.zapsplat.com for theme song and incidental music. Copyright David W. Rankin Jr. DBA The Old Mill Shop Music Experience.